Hey gardeners, Enoch here with the Urban Gardener and welcome to another of our Johnny Appleseed Organics Gardening Invitational videos where we're talking about tomatoes. In fact, we're talking about growing the biggest tomato that we've ever grown for the heaviest tomato category of the competition. Now normally in our gardens, we grow lots of different varieties of tomatoes as you see here in our greenhouse. In fact, I like to grow about 10 different varieties of tomatoes throughout our garden spaces each season. And most of those tomatoes we grow right here in our back fence line area because it gets a lot of really good sun. So that's where we're going to grow our competition tomatoes this season. But other than having this space selected and some good seeds that we got a couple of weeks back, it's going to take more than that to grow a really large tomato. So I've asked a good friend of ours, Gardener Scott, to join us to answer some questions and give us tips on growing the biggest tomato we've ever grown. So, all right, Gardener Scott, Thanks for joining us today here on the Urban Gardener to talk about growing the heaviest tomato for our Johnny Appleseed Organics Gardening Invitational. I'm glad to be here, Enoch. I think it's going to uh, be wonderful. I, I, I hope my information and your experience, we can actually get you the heaviest tomato. Excellent, excellent. I'm really looking forward to getting this grown. And as I did mention to you already, we did get a variety already picked out and I've got it already sown. And so we've got starts that are going to be ready to be planted here pretty soon. So one of my first questions I want to start with here is what do you think would be the best timing for planting out my tomato starts? And, and so um, great question. And, and let me start by saying for anything you're going to grow, particularly a fruit that you want to be a large fruit, genetics are key. And so having chosen a variety that has already shown that it can produce large fruit is critical. And so for any of your other viewers thinking that they can just pick whatever tomato plant that they're planning to grow and that they're going to get a seven or nine pound tomato, it's not going to happen unless you have the right kind of genetics. And so looking at the starts you have and when to get them in the ground, that also is a consideration. And so I'm not sure if you've asked the questions about the history of that particular tomato, but the, the soil temperature generally is a very important factor when you're going to be growing uh, tomatoes. And so the soil temperature should be at least 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, that's probably not an issue for you. You're probably already at that point. But 75 to 80 is actually better. And so if you see cold weather coming, cooler nights, and you're concerned about the soil temperature, measure it and, and don't put those plants out until you can be assured that the soil is warm and is going to stay warm because cold soil in the beginning can actually stunt a tomato plant and the plant will still grow it'll still give you flower and fruit but it'll be better if you can put it into the ground when it's warm if you, if you can wait until the nighttime temperatures are are at and staying above 50 degrees fahrenheit uh, that's also a good target excellent yes and that's Perfect, because that's probably right where we're going to be heading here probably in the next couple of weeks. And I do believe then that the start that I've chosen should be ready to go to get into the ground. And like you're talking about with genetics, I did find a really good variety. I've got some really great genetics, so I'm really looking forward to growing out these plants. So you're mentioning about soil temperature. Now, is there something I should be thinking about as far as the soil itself? Soil is really key and important to growing most anything in the garden. So are there any suggestions about what I should be looking out for when it comes to the soil that I'll be planting these tomatoes in? Yeah, absolutely. Ideally, you should have a good, rich, loose, amended soil, a lot of organic matter in the soil. Because as you start growing tomatoes, tomatoes really like a consistently moist environment. 
You can let them dry out a little bit. You can really try to avoid overwatering and underwatering. And one of the best ways to do that is with a good amended soil because that organic matter helps retain the soil moisture and helps it stay more consistent. As far as the nutrients in the soil, an amended soil should also be able to provide just about all the nutrients that you would be looking for. So when, I, when I'm putting my tomatoes in, I've already amended the soil. I already have those organics in. And then mulch, I think, is also a critical component of soil health. So after you plant the tomatoes, make sure that you're mulching and also that helps keep that consistent soil moisture. And maybe any other like organic type of amendments you might actually put into the soil as well. And, and so, you know, I'm, I, I operate under the, the assumption that you're already growing in good soil. You may not need a, additional amendments if you've already started with a good amended rich organic soil. But if you're concerned about some of the deficiencies, then it, worm castings are ideal. Doing a top dressing of compost mid season is also a, a good idea. I like to put a compost on in addition to the mulch. And every time I water and every time it rains, the, the water goes through that top layer of compost and essentially creates a compost extract. And all the nutrients from the compost are now going into the soil to add extra nutrients and extra food for the, the soil microbes. And so those kind of organic materials, you can definitely add through the season. You just need to do it on top because you can't work it into the soil. Any sort of preference on a mulch at all that you would use in this situation? <clears throat> so I, I, I like to use mulches that I can reuse as soil organic matter. So in my vegetable garden, I use crushed leaves, dried grass clippings and straw, usually as a blend. I've got, I'm in a very windy area. So if I use any of those ingredients by themselves, they tend to blow away. But if I mix my leaves and my straw and my grass together, it tends to, to stay in place. And then at the end of the season, I can turn all of that material back into the soil to be the organic matter for next spring. Now that I've got my start put into our soil, these things are going to get started growing. Is there anything I should be thinking about as far as staking? Do you have any ideas about what I should be thinking about with that? So I'm assuming this is an indeterminate variety. Is it indeterminate? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so there, there's a couple ways you can approach this. And so when you want to grow large fruit, generally that means you're going to limit the number of flowers and fruit on the plant. So generally, if I'm growing an indeterminate tomato, I'm going to trellis it and grow it vertically. And my trellises are, are six feet tall for the most part. And then I train the vines and prune to fit my trellis. You might be thinking in, along the lines of limiting how much your plant's going to grow. So rather than allow your tomato plant to grow eight or 10 feet tall, you're probably going to want to prune it at somewhere between the five and six foot point. And then that way you can focus the plant's energy on the flower and the fruit production. Because every time you prune a plant, it's going to stress that plant. And the natural tendency for the plant is to put more flowers on to produce more fruit. And then if you start pruning off the side branches, the suckers, and pruning off the flowers, now the reaction of the plant is going to be to put as much energy into the fruit that's on the plant. And that should enable you to grow the, the biggest tomatoes possible. So I would encourage that you grow vertically so that you have good air circulation and reduce the possibility of any type of, of disease or mildew issues. And also by training the plant vertically, it allows you to see those suckers as soon as they develop. And then you can pinch off the suckers to put the plant's energy into 
however many vines that you choose to grow. Uh, I'm a big believer in my area. I have hail that will come in the summer and devastate the crop. I don't have a big pest problem, but I like to have backup. And so if you prune your plant to a single leader and then something happens to that leader, now you've just lost the entire crop. So I would encourage you do two, maybe three primary vines and then prune all the rest out. And so as far as your your trellis or whatever you're growing on, it needs to be an appropriate size so that you can have one, two or three primary vines growing on that structure. And that's one of the things I was going to ask you next too, was about pruning there you know, and taking off those suckers. So that's something you actually recommend doing when it comes to uh, those uh, secondary branches that are coming off. There's a trade-off when you, when you pluck off, pinch out, prune off the, the suckers. By allowing those suckers to grow, you will get full-size new vines and all of those new vines will have flowers and fruit on them. So if you yeah. don't pinch off the suckers, you're going to get a whole bunch of fruit. But the plant can only sustain a, a, a finite amount of fruit volume. And so if you have a whole bunch of fruit, it's going to be small. So by pinching off those suckers, you're basically allowing the plant to produce that same volume of fruit. But now you're only doing it with two or three or four or five individual fruits. So by pinching off the suckers and by pinching off extra flowers after the fruit that you want has started to develop, now the plant's energy is going into those remaining fruit and you're more likely to get the larger fruit because it, it's that finite amount of energy the, pl the plant is producing. And if it's going to produce two dozen tomatoes, you're gonna to get two dozen small tomatoes. But if you're yeah. only looking at three tomatoes, you're gonna get much larger fruit. How many tomatoes would you grow on one of your plants if you were growing a three stem tomato vine? The, the genetics of the plant has an upper limit as to the size of the fruit. And so you can plan to leave the fruit on for 150 days but it's going to ripen at whatever point it right. is genetically uh, designed to ripen at, which may yeah. be a hundred days. And yeah. so with the backup in mind, I would suggest two, at least two primary vines and probably two or three fruit on each of those vines and then allow that fruit to develop. And then as the season progresses, if it looks like that fruit is doing well, I would actually, and your season's longer than mine, I would actually allow some new suckers, new flowers, and new fruit to develop because what you'll often see with tomatoes is, is at different times of the season, you'll get better fruit production. And sometimes the earliest fruit is not going to be the biggest. It's going to be the fruit in the middle of the season that has all the ideal growing temperatures and to include soil and air. It's got all the, the nutrients from the soil organisms that are at their peak in the middle of summer. And then at the end of the season, it'll, the fruit will begin to falter. So if you kind of look at it as three phase for your harvest period and try to get some big fruit in the beginning, but really be focused on the big fruit in the middle of the season. Yeah and then expect that you'll have some late season fruit and that could very well be very large as well when you go with a single vine you are limiting the number of leaves to create the the, the energy through photosynthesis and so that's another reason to have multiple vines that might not necessarily have flowers and fruit on them but those those leaves are important to to feed the plants, which will ultimately feed the the fruit. I, I don't know if you've looked at all into like giant pumpkins, but but that's one of the things they do with giant pumpkins is they'll allow side branches, side vines to continue, but there's no flowers and no fruit on those 
side yeah. vines. It's purely the leaves so that that plant has the maximum photosynthesis and energy going to the, the fruit. So one of the last questions I've got for you, Scott, is talking about pests and diseases. Now, this is one of the big things when it comes to growing anything in the garden. There's all sorts of critters and things out there sure. that are looking to take our fruit from us. And these are really valuable fruits if we're going to be growing some really <laughs> large ones. So are there any sort of uh, diseases and pests that I should really be keeping my eye out for? Well, again, gets back to the soil. I'm a huge advocate of good soil. If your soil is good, if it's feeding the plants, your plants will be strong and they'll be able to fight off most of the pests and the diseases. Typically, it's it's the weak plants that have the, the most issues. In this case, because you're, you're, you're doing a competition and you don't want anything on your plant, I would actually consider planting some sacrificial plants around your tomatoes. Put nasturtiums that are great for attracting aphids and, and leaf sucking kind of pests. Uh, put other plants like um, brassicas that might be attracting caterpillars. The caterpillars are more likely to eat a brassica than a tomato plant. So, so put in some sacrificial magnet plants to deal with some of those pests. And if your tomatoes are strong, they're more likely to not even be approached by a pest if there's a weaker plant that the pests have already attacked. So that's one approach I would take. Get out at night if you if you have a, a tomato hornworm issue, get out at night with your, your flashlight and your black light and try to pick off the caterpillars at night before they devastate your plants in the morning. Because uh, that's not going to be fun to have the flowers and find out the next day that the caterpillars have eaten off all your, your flowers. And I think most of us have had that problem. Um, but then as far as the diseases, like I mentioned yeah. earlier, good air circulation around your plant is critical. Mulch on your soil also is important in this factor as well, because many of the tomato diseases are soil borne. They, they, they'll actually be in the soil and when you water or when it rains, the spores will bounce onto the plant and then that'll create the disease. So mulching can greatly reduce the likelihood of some of those diseases even finding your plants as well. Definitely water the soil rather than, than water the leaves. You don't want to do any overhead water. I'm, I know you know, already know that, but it's yeah. those kind of things to try to keep the diseases from, from getting a foothold in your uh, in, in your entire plant system with all of those different ones that you're, you're doing. And then the consistent moisture is, is really key as well. Blossom end rot is so prevalent in tomatoes and almost all soils have enough calcium in the soil so that blossom end rot shouldn't be an issue. And it, it really ends up being overwatering or underwatering that causes a weaker plant and causes that calcium deficiency that leads to blossom end right. So consistency, strong plants, something else for the, the pests to eat, and then a, a really good, healthy environment. And uh, you shouldn't have too many issues. Awesome, Scott. Thank you so much for all of this wonderful advice and tips <coughs> sure. on growing the biggest tomato that we can this year. I'm going to be getting out in the garden and working that soil and getting some amendments put in there and get everything all ready here real soon. Again, thank you very much for joining oh, us. Oh, my pleasure. I, I wish you the best and, and I, I hope you'll be able to use not only my tips, but your experience and all the other information you can find to get that largest tomato. So, all right, how about that? How awesome of Gardener Scott to join with us here on The Urban Gardener and give us some great growing tips so that we can grow the biggest tomato that we've ever grown before and win this category of the Johnny Appleseed Organics Gardening Invitational. Now, one of the things that he talked about right off the bat is genetics. There are a lot of varieties of tomatoes out there and plenty that will grow really large fruits. 
fact, I've grown a couple of really good sized tomatoes myself here in my gardens before. Now I wanna win this category of the competition. So I reached out to a friend of mine, Cindy Tobeck from up in Washington, and she won last year's Great Pumpkin Commonwealth Master Gardeners Competition, a worldwide competition. She grew the eighth largest tomato in the world of 2021 at 7.19 pounds. And she got those seeds actually from a tomato that was over nine pounds the year before. So we got seeds from her 7.19 pound tomato and I got those sewed out a couple of weeks ago. Now Cindy did send us five seeds. We sewed all five out and got all five to germinate, which is awesome. 100% germination is great no matter what you're growing. However, these seedlings shot right up and I didn't have my light quite low enough and they are just a little bit leggier than what I would have liked to have had, but they are tomatoes. And tomatoes, we're going to be burying them deep anyways each time we transplant them all the way into the garden outside. So I've got these larger pots here. What we're going to do is we're just gonna bury them nice and deep all the way up to our cotyledon leaves here and allow for root growth along that main stem as they continue to grow. And then when we grow up here in these pots, We'll be burying them again right up to the top there of the main stem and allow more root growth as we put them out into the main garden. So that's what we're going to be doing right now is transplanting them out into these larger pots. And then they'll continue to grow for just a few more weeks under our light station here. And then I'll start hardening them off right along with all of our peppers and everything else that we'll be hardening off that's growing in our artificial lights indoors. The weather's changing. We'll be gardening really soon with these warm weather crops right outside. And I'm really getting excited about that. So let's get these things transplanted into our larger pots. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add some soil right in here. We want the plant to be sitting right up right about like so so we're gonna need a little bit more soil in there so there we go we've got our tomato seedling buried nice and deep right up the main stem there. We'll put this back up underneath of the lights to continue growing for the next couple of weeks. And then when we get it buried out into the main garden, we'll bury it nice and deep again so that we can get some nice strong roots up that main stem. Hopefully get ourselves the strongest plant we can so that we can get the biggest fruit we can. Now there we go, we've got our variety of giant tomato all transplanted out into a larger container and up underneath of the lights. And I'm really excited about seeing how well that these plants grow over the coming weeks until we get them transplanted out into the main gardens. And again, thank you to Gardener Scott for joining with us here and giving us some great growing tips so that we can grow the best plant possible so that we can get the biggest tomato possible and win this category of the Johnny Appleseed Organics Gardening Invitational. 
And again, thank you all for joining with me here for another of our videos in this video series. And I'll see all of you for our next category. Thank you everyone for watching this video on our Johnny Appleseed Organics Invitational. And remember, these videos run every other week. And on next week, be sure to tune in and check out another one of our Micro Pepper Farm Vlogs. So, we'll see all of you next week.